Welcome everybody. Welcome to our symposium, Contested Collections Grappling with History and Forging Pathways for Repatriation. My name is Jade Alboro. I'm the librarian curator for Southeast Asian Studies and Pacific Island Studies here at UCLA. And, and I'm one of the co-leads for the symposium's planning team. This afternoon's program is the last of the four programs of the symposium. And we'll, we will be talking about paving a way forward current and future approaches to restitution. So let us now begin with a welcome from Virginia Steele, the UCLA Norman and Armina Powell University Librarian. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for this symposium, Contested Collections, Grappling with History and Forging Pathways for Repatriation. My name is Ginny Steele and I am the Norman and Armina Powell University Librarian at the UCLA Library. As we begin today, I would like to acknowledge that as a land grant institution, we at UCLA acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, which includes the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands. Consistent with our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we believe that understanding the historical and current experiences of indigenous peoples informs the work we do. So again, thank you for coming today. We're really happy to have you here as we open this discussion about repatriation, particularly repatriation as it applies to materials that are held in libraries and archives. As many of us may have realized when thinking about the general topic of repatriation, much of the discussion we've heard over the last several decades has focused on artifacts in museums and art held in museums and galleries, but there's been relatively little attention paid to materials that are in libraries and archives. At UCLA, we were contacted a few years ago by a Jewish institution in Munich to return a book to our collection that belonged to their library but was looted by the Nazis. We gladly returned the item but didn't think much more about it. Then last year, we were contacted another time, a second time, this time by the Jewish Museum in Prague. A curator there contacted Diane Mizrahi, our librarian for Jewish and Israel studies. They had identified three books through Hadi Trust that rightfully belonged to their library. The scanned images in Hadi Trust included their property stamps and accession numbers. When Diane communicated the news to her colleagues in the International and Area Studies Department in the UCLA Library, their outreach team led by Jade Alburo felt that it was important not just to share what UCLA is doing in repatriating these books, but to use it as a jumping off point to initiate a broader dialogue about repatriation. Why there's a need for it in the first place, and why it continues to be a difficult and complicated discussion. This symposium provides a more global context for this conversation by acknowledging the long history of colonialism, war, and even field research that has led to cultural heritage materials being taken from their communities and countries. As libraries, archives and other cultural memory institutions begin to talk about decolonizing their collections, it is crucial to recognize that decolonization is not just about adding underrepresented voices to our collections, but it's also about understanding how materials in our collections came to be there, how they were obtained, whether they were taken from their original owners without their consent, and whether and how they should be returned to the communities and individuals from whom they were taken. In this symposium, you will hear about various issues related to repatriation, including notions of ownership and caretaking. You'll hear examples from museums and libraries, because we hope that many institutions will be interested in exploring and implementing reparative practices. You will also hear examples of existing policies and procedures that institutions and government agencies have put in place. And we'll have some ideas for working with the communities that own the materials in the first place. 
We're very happy to have you with us as we explore this for ourselves and determine what our next steps should be. At the UCLA Library, we are very committed to restitution and we do expect to do more in the future. We hope you will be too. I'd like to thank everyone at UCLA who's been involved in the planning of this symposium, Jade Alboro and Tula Oram for leading the planning team, as well as members Elena Ising, Dana Laterer, and Yesenia Perez. Additional thanks to Sharon Farb, Shannon Tanhai Ahari, Giselle Rios, Magali Salas, the library communications team, and library business services. And thank you to the UCLA Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies for co-sponsoring the symposium. We appreciate all the hard work of all these individuals and the contributions that have been made. And we thank you for bringing us all together. And to our uh, viewers and members of the audience, thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to continued discussion with many of you as we all try to figure out what the best way is to approach the need for us to look at our collections and identify materials that were taken without consent from their owners and return them to the communities and individuals where they belong. Enjoy the symposium. Thank you so much, Ginny, for, the, for that welcome. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator, TK Sangwand. TK Sangwand is a certified archivist, librarian, and DJ. And over the past 13 years, she has worked with UCLA and the University of Texas Austin to build preservation partnerships for human rights documentation and cultural heritage materials in the US, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. She holds a master's in library and information sciences and MA in Latin American studies from UCLA. In 2017, she was named a Fulbright Specialist in Library and Information Science. And in 2018, 2019, she was a Fulbright Scholar with Mexico's Ministry of Culture. Since 2001, TK has worked in community radio and currently hosts the program, The Archive of Feelings on dublab.com. Everyone, please welcome TK Sangwan. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jade. Um, and thank you to the organizers again for putting together such a thought-provoking symposium. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next distinguished panelist. Starting us off, we have Leila Aminadole, who is a founder of Aminadole and Associates. She is a leading expert in art, cultural heritage, and intellectual property law, and has represented a wide range of entities such as collectors, museums, galleries, dealers, nonprofits, artists, estates, foundations, and foreign governments. She has been involved in high profile contractual disputes, cultural heritage law violations, the recovery of stolen art and antiquities, complex fraud schemes, authentication disputes, art bat loans, and the sale of hundreds of million dollars of arts and collectibles. Layla also regularly lectures internationally and publishes on a wide variety of legal topics in addition to teaching courses on international art and cultural heritage law at Fordham University School of Law and Art Crime and the Law at New York University. Please join me in welcoming Layla. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you, thank all the organizers for inviting me to speak on this panel today. Before I begin, I want to just perhaps preemptively apologize. Um, I told my fellow panelists that my husband had just tested positive for COVID and um, my young child may break into the room at some point during the talk. I'm trying to avoid that, but there's a chance that a toddler will come running onto the screen at some point. So I apologize in advance. So as I only have a short time to discuss this very broad topic of the restitution of cultural heritage, I've chosen a few of my favorite cases to discuss and I'm only providing a very cursory analysis of these matters. I'd also like to note that I'm a US attorney, so my scholarship is primarily focused on US law. So cultural heritage disputes generally begin in one of three ways. First, a foreign government may file a lawsuit for the return of looted property. Second, a foreign government may request the return of stolen property through private communications, through negotiations and settlement discussions. 
Or third, U.S. law enforcement authorities may investigate claims and file legal actions for the return of objects. And I'll discuss each of these scenarios this afternoon. One of the most famous antiquities repatriations cases involves four mosaics that were stolen from Cyprus. The mosaics were pillaged from the Cypriot church following the Turkish intervention in Cyprus of 1974. By the end of 1976, all Cypriots living in the village where this church was located, they had fled. Afterwards, the mosaics were violently removed from the church and ushered onto the black market. In 1979, Cyprus learned that the mosaics had been stolen and a fervent campaign began to locate the artifacts. In 1988, an American dealer named Peg Goldberg flew to Europe to purchase a painting. That sale fell through, but within days of seeing photos of the mosaics, Goldberg purchased them for a little over $1 million. She tried to sell the works by contacting collectors who might be interested. In this way, word of each church authorities that the works were in Goldberg's possession and then the church requested their return. The church even offered Goldberg reimbursement for the purchase price. She refused, so the Cypriot church sued. The case actually involved very complex issues related to choice of law determinations with Goldberg zealously arguing that the case should be dismissed because the mosaics were removed long before the church filed its lawsuit. Ultimately though, the litigation proceeded. The court determined that the property was stolen and Goldberg was ordered to return the items. The court found that Cyprus adequately demonstrated the suspicious circumstances of the sale. First, Goldberg knew the mosaics came from a conflict zone. Second, they were cut away from a building and of our unique cultural value. Third, they were purchased for a low price of only a little over a million dollars in contrast to the market price of the mosaics, which was $20 million. Fourth, Goldberg knew little of the salesmen. Um, and in fact, one of them happened to be facing criminal charges for other art crimes. And finally, the sale occurred very quickly within just a matter of days. Goldberg did not conduct due diligence, and she perjured herself by lying about the transaction. The court ultimately found that she had acted in bad faith and that the works belonged to the Cypriot Church. So this case, the reason I'm mentioning this one is it's quite notable in US, U.S. jurisprudence because this U.S. court was in a federal court in Indiana. The court acknowledged the importance of due diligence. Unfortunately, though, the works were, were irreparably damaged. Initially, they were removed from their location, and then they were conserved, meaning that they were flattened to appear for sale in a commercial gallery. Mosaics were returned, but only as a result of a costly litigation and a lengthy battle. The specter of legal action will sometimes lead to voluntary returns, eliminating this need for costly litigation. And perhaps one of the most famous cases involving cultural heritage, I'll discuss the Euphronius Crater. In 1972, the Metropolitan Museum of Art acquired the famed Euphronius Crater for, I think, $1.2 million. At the time, it was the most expensive antiquity acquisition in history. Then director of the museum, Thomas Toving, announced that the crater had been purchased from a private English collector, but he refused to reveal the identity of the base's previous owner and of that dealer. Italian authorities were convinced it was looted, but they couldn't prove the object's origin. Decades passed and nothing could be done until evidence serendipitously revealed that the crater was indeed looted. In 1995, during a seemingly unrelated investigation over illegal trafficking, Italian authorities discovered evidence of a looting network revealing that the crater was stolen from an Etruscan tomb. Quite sadly, to avoid detection at customs, the vase was broken into pieces. This very rare and very valuable object, it was intentionally broken so that it could be exported from Italy and into the US more easily. Due to Italy's strict patrimony laws, so this is the individual who was kind of the, the ringleader, kind of at the center of this looting network. But due to Italy's strict patrimony laws, antiquities found within its soil belong to Italy, and it's illegal to sell, 
and export these objects without permission from state authorities. Patrimony laws are key for the protection of antiquities. These laws allows, allow nations to protect the objects found within their borders by vesting ownership of antiquities found within the country and to the country in which the object was found. Because the crater was found within the borders of Italy, it belonged to Italy. Once the Italian authorities had evidence the crater was looted, the country was able to bring a repatriation claim against the men. However, the government never did so. They never had to file a claim because the evidence was so clear. The Met and the Italian government signed an agreement under which the Euphronius crater and several other items from the museum were returned to Italy in exchange for long-term loans of Italian objects. The crater returned to Italy in January, 2008, and now it's housed in the Archaeological Museum of Trivetti as part of a strategy of returning works of art to their place of origin. So this matter, the reason, it's probably my favorite case involving cultural heritage or favorite matter involving cultural heritage. It's really important for a number of reasons. First, it was highly publicized. So it really drew attention to the problem of looting and the international market for looted artifacts. It demonstrated Italy's determination in recovering antiquities, and it resulted in a successful loan program that led to a, num a number of other museums repatriating works to Italy. Finally, the matter demonstrates the challenges for source nations. It's often difficult to prove when an object left the country. The possessor or dealer can concoct a false provenance or an ownership history stating that it's been in a private collection since the 1800s or some arbitrary date prior to the passage of patrimony, a patrimony law. Here though, Italy was lucky in that the authorities uncovered written and photographic proof of the looting, but most cases do not involve such clear evidence. And here the evidence was a collection of Polaroid photos that recorded the objects that were found, um, looted that were brought on the market. And in some of those images, these artifacts were even covered in dirt and photographed in their fine spot. So this, I really don't think I have enough time to get into this, but what could the Met have done? Well, the Met could have more, you know, more strongly scrutinized these objects and conducted greater due diligence on the Euphronius crater and other objects that eventually were returned to Italy. Um, I think it's necessary that museums and art collectors not simply accept the representations of dealers and auction houses and um, those individuals selling these objects. So I think greater scrutiny is used. So I've discussed the situation in which a foreign government will sue for the return of an object, um, how a government and a private institution may just engage in discussions when there is some evidence to, to prove that an object is looted. And in some cases, US law enforcement authorities are involved in these repatriations. So I'll briefly address two matters because they were resolved in slightly different ways. The first one involves the dispute over this statue, which began in 2011, when the Kingdom of Cambodia initiated legal action against Sotheby's in New York. The auction house was selling this 10th century statue of an epic warrior that was purportedly looted in or around 1972 from Ko Kerr. In fact, we can pinpoint the exact place from where the statue originated because of this photo. And again, we often don't have such clear proof of a fine spot, so this information was crucial in this case. After being hacked off its base, the work entered the black market and was sold to a Belgian collector in around 1975. As a way of context, Cambodia experienced a brutal period of conflicts and civil wars in the 1960s and the 1970s during which time archaeological site, the archaeological site of Koh Kerr fell victim to extensive looting. The collector's wife consigned the work to auction in 2010 and imported the statue into the United States. A Sotheby's researcher expressed concerns about the statue in an email, stating that she thought it was stolen. But that expert later changed her opinion and advised the auction house that Cambodia generally doesn't request the return of looted art. So she was wrong. 
On the day of the auction, Cambodian officials requested that Sotheby's withdraw the statue and return it. Sotheby's did withdraw it, but supported the consigner's ownership claim. So the U.S. Department of Homeland Security ended up filing a forfeiture action. In December of 2013, the U.S. government and Sotheby's eventually signed a settlement agreement for the return of the statue. So why did Sotheby's settle? Both parties publicly stated that litigation would be burdensome. However, avoiding a court battle also avoids revealing harmful information during the discovery phase of litigation, during the phase when documents are exchanged and parties um, conduct depositions and interrogatories. So perhaps one of the reasons that this was settled is that perhaps that the auction house did not want to share all this information and have it become public. This case revealed, though, that the auction house did investigate the work um, and its history, but chose to ignore red flags indicating that the statue was looted. But due to that case, a number of other similar statues were returned. Around the same time as Sotheby's return, the Norton Simon Museum returned its own Cambodian statue to its home, as did the Metropolitan Museum of Art. At the Norton Simon Museum, the work was returned as a gift. Um, so I want to turn now to a case involving a private um, donor, and this is a, a, an image of a repatriation ceremony, and I'm actually going to end my talk with, um, with my perspective on why I think these ceremonies are so valuable and, and special. So this case, U.S. versus Schultz, is one of the best known cases in U.S. law involving looted art, and it actually led to the imprisonment of an antiquities dealer named Fred Schultz. Fred Schultz was a well-known New York antiquities dealer. Or he still is, I mean, he's, he's alive, although he no longer deals in antiquities. Um, and he was the former president of the National Association of Dealers in Ancient Oriental and Primitive Art. He eventually was indicted for receiving, conspiring to receive stolen Egyptian antiquities. He worked with this man, Jonathan Tokely Parry, a British tomb raider who smuggled antiquities out of Egypt. He is a self-proclaimed antiquities restorer known for smuggling over 3,000 pieces out of Egypt. He supplied Schultz with objects by disguising the antiquities as cheap souvenirs. So you can see it on this first slide that he would cover them in paper mache, paint them over to make them appear, to make the actual antiquities look like they were cheap trinkets purchased in a bazaar. And then he cre also created this false provenance, this false ownership history by inventing a fictional collection. Many pieces were smuggled out of, uh, out of Egypt, including um, this antiquity on the left-hand side. In 2001, Schultz was indicted under the National Stolen Property Act. Under the act, it is a crime to deal in property that has been stolen, unlawfully converted or taken, knowingly, knowing the same to be stolen. The law applies to property that is stolen from a foreign government, where that government asserts ownership of the property pursuant to a patrimony law. So I mentioned the patrimony laws in Italy that protected objects found within its borders. It's the same for Egypt. Egypt has passed these laws. The earliest of its laws were passed in the mid 19th century. So Egypt has a long history of protecting its property by these patrimony laws. The objects that were smuggled in through Schultz and Togli Parry fell under this law, law number 117 of 1983. Schultz was tried before a jury and he served 33 months in jail and paid a fine of $50,000. The challenge typically facing these source nations, like source nations like Egypt and Italy, is proving that property was taken from within its borders after these patrimony laws were put in place. Here, Jonathan Tokely Parry kept a journal of his exploits, so it made it easier for authorities to prove that these parties were dealing in loot, loot items that were removed from Egypt after its patrimony law was um, put in place, and that the parties knowingly conducted this type of illegal activity. Unfortunately, the legal framework that I've discussed is not enough to deter the illicit trade in art and antiquities, and it also does not ensure that looted items are returned home. For one, as I mentioned, there are challenges proving that objects were removed in contravention of heritage laws, meaning that it's often difficult or even impossible to prove that an artifact 
was removed after a certain date. For fine art, it's the same. It's difficult to prove that an item was stolen or sold under duress, particularly because many collectors did not maintain extensive or detailed documentation about their art holdings. And I think we see this very clear when we talk about Nazi looted art, when there is a displacement of millions of people who are fleeing their homes, they're generally not you know, packing along with them documents about their art, sales receipts, sales and purchase agreements. So it's often hard for the victims of these thefts to prove that they own this artwork. Other problems uh, are related to the system in which there are nations that have not developed laws in line with Western or European American the legal systems, meaning that there are nations without patrimony laws or adequate regulations and laws to provide the basis for repatriation demand. This reliance on Western laws and restitution jurisprudence put other nations or groups at a disadvantage. A third challenge is that the owner of an object or collection of objects may not be a nation, but rather a community of people, such as indigenous groups that are not defined by geographical or sovereign boundaries. Another um, problem to consider is that the legal solution, and I often say this when I give lectures on the law, is that the legal solution is not always the just one. Heritage has been stolen under brutal and unjust circumstances, and there may not be legal remedies, at least as we know them, as we know them today, for these thefts. Items stolen during these times may have not technically broken any laws, as the items were perhaps not owned in the Western definition of what ownership is. However, through today's ethical lens, there were takings that were part of a cruel or horrific campaign, and those should be re-examined and returned to honor ethical considerations. A very poignant example is the theft of the Benin bronzes that were stolen during the partition of Africa. Thousands of artistic treasures were stolen from the former kingdom of Benin during brutal campaigns in that region. Museums and collectors today are considering, and not all museums, just to say, but some museums and some collectors have considered the return of some of these artifacts and have actually returned some of them due to ethical concerns, but not legal arguments. So fifth, and the, the last point I would like to make is that you know, I, I talked about these three mechanisms in which objects are returned, but as a lawyer, I would say that sometimes the legal solution is not the best one, that sometimes diplomacy is more effective than legal battles. Nations such as the Netherlands are engaged in diplomatic efforts to return works to former colonies, such as Indonesia and Sri Lanka. And of course, there are some legal complications there, um, which I guess we can address in the Q&A if people are interested. Um, but there are some nations that are addressing this, this, this past and um, the return of objects. So although my, my talk is focused on antiquities and cultural heritage, some of the same concepts I've discussed apply to fine art, books, and other valuable cultural items. For example, the Nazi party in Germany attempted to legitimize their thefts by documenting the transfer of ownership during duress sales. Unfortunately, the law has not adequately addressed some of those controversies either. Last year, the United States Supreme Court dismissed a case against Germany involving a priceless collection of religious artworks. The case was dismissed due to lack of jurisdiction, this really technical argument, and the heirs of the owners of the collection never actually had their day in court. They alleged that the collection was sold under duress, but they never had the opportunity to prove this due to the case's dismissal. To end on a positive note, Cultural heritage has been repatriated without parties resorting to litigation or contentious battles. There are people who do voluntarily return items that were illegally removed. Just earlier this week on Monday, I traveled to Texas. Uh, so I'm not from Texas, I'm up here in New York, which is why it might be a little bit noisy, but I traveled down to Texas for a ceremony celebrating my client's voluntary return of a marble bust to the rightful owner. The work was looted from Germany during World War II and went missing for over seven decades. And it was discovered in a Goodwill store by my client. 
She chose to return the work to Germany. It was completely voluntary. Um, she thought it was the rightful home. And I think that's something really nice to celebrate. In addition, nations are today engaging in discussions about how to repatriate objects taken during colonial periods. These discussions evolve not only the law, but ethical and moral considerations as well. I think we have a long way to go, but it's really, I think it's really positive that these discussions are occurring with more frequency. Upon restitution, ceremonies are often held to celebrate returns. These are opportunities to educate the public about the art market. There are also opportunities to build diplomatic relationships and celebrate cultural exchange. But more than that, repatriations are an opportunity to honor the past and perhaps in some way attempt to correct the past. As we grapple with looting from past decades, past generations, we have the opportunity to treat these objects with respect and return them to their rightful homes. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for sharing those fascinating case studies, Layla. Um, and I want to remind everyone to please enter your questions for Layla into the chat box, uh, or sorry, into the Q&A box, not the chat box. We will be responding to the questions after all the presenters have completed their presentations. So next up, we have Damien Webb joining us from Australia. Damien identifies as a queer Palawa man from Southeast Tasmania. He has worked in a number of roles at both the Western Australian and New South Wales State Libraries. He previously coordinated the State Library of Western Australia's Storylines Project and has a passion for decolonizing archives and library collections. In his current role as a manager of the Indigenous Engagement Branch at the State Library of New South Wales, he works with a small team of dedicated Indigenous and non-Indigenous staff to indigenize colonial institutional collections and practices. Please join me in welcoming Damien. Hi, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Um, yeah, thank you. Firstly, thank you for having me here today. Um, it is five, six o'clock in the morning over here in Australia, so you'll forgive if I'm a little bit blurry. Um, as always, and as protocol here, um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm on the unceded sovereign country of the Gadigal people, uh, where I work and live, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and I would especially like to extend that respect to any First Nations or Indigenous people that are joining us here today. I am a Palawa First Nations Indigenous man from Tasmania and a second generation queer, so I'm very used to working in uncomfortable spaces. I have a human rights background and as was just mentioned, I've spent about 10 years working in state libraries and archives um, to be that connective tissue between First Nations communities and um, often quite quite stodgy and terrified uh, archives and memory institutions. Uh, I'm a curator, a library worker, and a community outreach specialist, I suppose. Uh, and I currently convene Black Force, which is the uh, national uh, First Nations support network for staff that work within state and national institutions. And I'm a member of two of the expert advisory boards for the peak library organizations in Australia. So I've got a very good sense of um, what's happening in Australia from this perspective. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to share some of uh, the good and the bad. Um, I suppose it always strikes me as interesting in these international symposia and gatherings that um, Australia is seen to be quite ahead in a lot of ways um, in terms of some of the steps we've taken to address these issues. Um, but I suppose the reality is that uh, in some ways we have actually skipped a few steps um, it's only been about 230 years since colonization. And I have to say that in the Australian library context, restitution and redress are words I have almost never heard spoken. Um, for those that aren't aware, crash course, um, there are hundreds of sovereign First Nations, tribes and clans and family groups within Australia. There is no uh, Aboriginal Australia as such. There is no uh, central block or authority. Um, what we have are many of these clans and families that are disconnected from their ancestral country, um, which is the term we use for homeland, their family networks and their cultural knowledge. So this stems from um, the, the, the brutal history of colonization, um, forced removals and genocides that, that form the first hundred or so years, what we refer to as the frontier wars in Australia. So 
as was uh, mentioned, uh, Virginia actually mentioned, libraries and repatriation is a strange, a strange idea. For a lot of libraries, um, we don't see it with the same urgency or haven't until recently. Um, we don't tend to house uh, human remains. Um, we often don't have uh, cultural objects. What we have are representations or instances of knowledge which was stolen in much the same way. So many of the missing pieces from, from my family, from our people's cultures, from First Nations um, knowledge systems, which was an 80,000 year strong oral tradition, many of these pieces are actually within the archives and collections of state and national libraries. And even more problematically, are contained within the collections of settler colonists. And this is these collections form the basis of our earliest collecting efforts. So these include word lists of languages which uh, uh, were not lost, were, were taken, were, were stamped out, and people are trying to rebuild. Songs and ceremonies, um, ethnographic and anthropological observations of our culture, things like ration and blanket lists that often contain uh, ethnographies and ethnologies that reveal family connections that people are desperately trying to make. So there is a vital importance to ensuring that these collections are understood from the perspective of those that uh, they impact the most. And that is still something we are struggling with. The library I currently work in is the oldest collecting institution in Australia. It began collecting in 1826, which is a very young by international standards and um, very, very young by the standards of history and deep time that First Nations people in Australia understand history. I suppose, to put it in context, the, the building itself is made of sandstone, which was taken from the land. Um, so the actual colonial structure is made from our country. Uh, the mortar that holds these bricks together was made from our shell middens, which were um, and remain evidence of our ancient occupation. Australia does not recognise our sovereignty um, and is still deeply divided over the facts that make up our violence and often genocidal history. Um, and to many people in Australia, libraries still represent capital H history. Um, I suppose I think of, of libraries and our traditions as an outsourced form of Western memory and legacy. Um, I suppose for, for non-Indigenous and non-First Nations people, particularly uh, white European traditions, they're very comfortable with external institutions taking on that role of holding their memory, their stories, their anecdotes, their understandings. Um, and that's definitely not the case for many First Nations people. Um, as a result, these, these, these institutions and their legacies are deeply protected by the status quo. And it's often not until you start digging into that and interrogating that, that um, the, the racism and the uh, deep resistance to change uh, it starts to present itself. Libraries were and remain part of the colonial cabal who, who were responsible from, for and continue to benefit from in many ways our destruction and erasure. Um, that being said, there is a shift in libraries, uh, particularly around interrogating these biases and blind spots. So we've seen uh, basically since its inception the Library of Congress subject headings, the Dewey Decimal systems of classification. Um, have been broadened. They were, they were never built for um, the kinds of ways that we remember and the kinds of knowledge that we prioritise or the kinds of cultural restrictions and hierarchies, uh, if we even have hierarchies, that uh, present themselves in our knowledge systems. Uh, but we are seeing through, um, some, some people may be aware, the OCLC Descriptive Workflows project, which I was part of, um, is really interrogating language, how we speak about these collections and the assumptions we carry in our systems. There are new engagement models all the time. Engagement is uh, one of those bugbears uh, for, for a lot of us that work in this sector as First Nations and Indigenous people. Um, engagement can be anything from speaking to elders um, about critical cultural collections or it can be doing um, what one elder referred to as pretty business, which is you know, having a morning tea for uh, reconciliation, which doesn't really achieve anything but allows institutions to feel that they're stepping into that space. We are starting to see systems like ICIP, so Indigenous Cultural and Intellectual Property, um, where in Australia we don't have a legal framework to protect 
or we claim the knowledge that's within these collections. Um, ICIP is um, designed by a woman named Terry Janke to fill in that gap where we don't have a legal framework to lean on and instead looking at an aspirational moral framework um, much more aligned with systems like Creative Commons. Um, we're seeing the invocation of terms like decolonization and truth telling very, very regularly, um, though not always in a critical sense. But in a classic library form, we do still seek to approach this as a problem to be solved um, and ideally automated. I mean, I think that's something that plagues libraries is our, our need for efficiency in organisation. So in Australia, we, we tend to use other R words. We talk about reconciliation and we talk about recognition. Um, and I suppose it's worth just taking a moment to consider how differently those words hit um, when you are trying to speak to and with communities that have had knowledge taken and now have to go back to the perpetrators to, to rebuild their own identity. Um, there's a, a very well-known artist from, from my country in Tassie who uh, says that uh, I have nothing to reconcile. We've skipped over a step in Australia in many ways and we're trying to, to reconcile two bodies of knowledge and, and two cultural blocks, I suppose, that um, do not have equal power and that, that, that hasn't really been understood. Um, we talk about reconciliation or, or recognising traditional owners, but we need to understand who are we framing as perpetrators and who are we placing the burden of finding a solution on when we talk that way. And I'm very excited about bringing more terminology around restitution you know, into the work. So, I mean, as an example, more than 20 years ago, a group called uh, Atsalo, apologies for the acronyms, uh, this was a First Nations-led group of experts that created a comprehensive set of protocols for working with First Nations knowledge, specifically in libraries and archives. And these are largely ignored by the sector, but remain a Bible for, for those of us who are Indigenous and First Nations and work to affect change. Um, as a result of a few recent projects, those are now being um, brought back to the, to the fore um, but it never ceases to amaze me how many professional librarians that have worked in the sector for 30 or 40 years have, have never heard of them or have never even bothered to do a quick search for them because they are widely available. At some point during the, um, uh, the digitisation craze, the fetish of the early 2000s libraries, particularly here, started to invest in a concept known as digital repatriation. Um, I'm assuming some people have heard of this term or have, have used this process. This is well-intentioned, but it is actually quite a flawed process. It, it, it uses the term repatriation, but it is actually usually a, a, more, a form of culturally informed access. It's usually providing copies. And it is very important that we provide these copies to people that may not have seen members of their family that are seeing um, images or, or reading text that helps them to rebuild their identity. That is not the same as repatriation. It is not the same as returning control and authority. Um, and we've become a little bit tangled in that term. So I, I usually prefer to refer to a, um, a digital return. But again, there are systems and ways to do that that um, tackle the crux of the issue. I think what's important to remember is that Digitization is a natural intervention point in our collection. The material is out there, the human being looking at it. If we don't capitalize on that moment to interrogate the material, to bring First Nations perspectives in, and we just digitize with the information we have and throw it into whatever system we're using, we're taking that entire problematic context and simply digitizing that as well. So the Storylines project was mentioned, that was a project I worked on in Western Australia, largely around photographs, so the bulk of, of photographs, early photographs of First Nations people will have simple captions like uh, natives in the desert. They, they will have no, there's no intention, there's no attempt to identify those people to, to turn these into human beings that had families, that had authorities, that had stories. So. Um, there was about 5,000 photos returned, completely recaptioned, completely um, re re rewritten, basically. Um, and then that information was, was added to the library record. 
So the, the good examples that I've seen, which are storylines, some of you may have heard of Mukachu and some of the uh, community First Nations led keeping places that are created using that software. These things focus on community curation, the possibility and insistence on multiple truths, and working with the fragmented histories that our peoples carry. We often need to connect with each other and with these problematic colonial sources to actually paint a full picture. And most of the systems that we use, uh, the digital asset management systems or access systems we use, are designed to really just focus on um, that one aspect. For me, this, this term decolonization, it's vital, um, but we do have to think about the hard limits of decolonization. Um, the reality that libraries who are steeped in Western and colonial history may not be able, be able to ever fully decolonize. That instead we can look to ways that we can decentralize, that we can remove ourselves as the sole authority. Um, so we talk of advisory boards, changes to work, uh, descriptive workflows, but those, those bring us into the center. Those, those force us to engage with the center and with the libraries and authority. Instead, we're starting to look at ways that we can um, reverse that. So at the moment, we've been setting up First Nations digitization hubs in cultural language and local museums that are First Nations run in regional areas rather than seeing the library as the natural point for collections to end in and to, to live in, we recognize that some knowledge will never be appropriate to be kept in institutions and that communities need to be empowered to work. Uh, empowered is definitely not the right word, they already have power. Need to be recognized and supported to do that work. So we've set up four of these independent hubs providing the technology, the training, the funding, so that these materials stay on country but are still preserved and described to uh, a preservation standard. What this also does is remove one of the biggest obstacles to repatriation that we see in First Nations communities, which is the instant kind of moment where an institution tells you you don't have the facilities or the training to look after this, we couldn't get it back, we'll be destroyed. Um, that comes up time and time again. So instead, we're leveraging our expertise and instead of asking communities to translate themselves into our work, we try to do the opposite. We try to map library systems and priorities to community plans to recognize the knowledge and skills that they have in community as expertise. Um, I am starting to run out of time, but I'll bring up one last point. Um, none of this work can be achieved without human intervention, and staffing in Australia is, um, is an issue. Two recent reports by ALIA and NSLA, which are two of the peak bodies, highlight critical underrepresentation of First Nations employees. There are very few of us. In fact, there, there are only two. Uh, First Nations staff members in the entire country within state and national libraries above my level at a manager. So we're not in positions of power. Um, where are, there are some instances where there is one First Nations person in the entire institution. Um, and all of that work, all of those relationships, all of that critical decolonization, um, the opening of the archives falls on one person. So in the last two years, we actually ran a project where all staff at all levels of every single state and territory of National Library completed 20 hours of mandatory cultural safety training. So this was designed to help them understand privilege and institutionalized racism, and was very successful in shifting the perceptions towards the biases and the gaps and the holes in our work that, that often we only see from the outside. Unfortunately, it did depend on First Nations staff to deliver that because um, I, I firm believe that decolonization cannot be undertaken without our input. Um, otherwise, it becomes a very circular um, naval gazing activity. But the cost to us as staff was, was quite extreme. Um, it exposed First Nations staff to some of the, um, the worst racism um, and staff use and workflows. Um, in order to try and help save the library from itself, which I have to say is a very important thing, but we do need to be aware that a project like that can't necessarily count as decolonization. It still settlers, uh, it still centers the settler colonists, and while it is important to build their capacity and empathy and cultural understanding, it's never going to achieve um, what we need to achieve. I think um, anything that's comfortable cannot be critical, and we all I suppose we need to remember that the core of our profession is about protecting memory and legacy. 
and this is the source of many of our collections, and the, the inspiration for many of our staff, but we have to consider whose forms of memory and whose legacies are being prioritised. Um, neutrality is a myth, and in our profession, a, a very dangerous and seductive one, I found. I think that's my time, so I will now be quiet. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Damien. Um, I really appreciated what you said about neutrality being a very dangerous and seductive myth. I think that's something that all information workers should keep in mind. Um, once again, just want to remind folks, please put your questions for Damien in the Q&A box. We will get to that after the last presentation. So lastly, um, I will be introducing Dr. Khadija von Zinnenberg Carroll. Unfortunately, Dr. Carroll is not able to join us in person today to give her presentation uh, because she had a conflicting event for her book launch. Um, so we will be replaying a recording of her presentation, but we're hopeful that she'll be able to join us for the Q&A session afterwards. So Dr. Khadija von Zinnenberg Carroll is an artist and historian currently leading the project Repatriates, our artistic research in museums and communities in the process of repatriation from Europe. She is professor of history at the Central European University in Vienna and honorary professor and chair of global art at the University of Birmingham. She is the author of several books, including Art in the Time of Colony, The Importance of Being Anachronistic, Botanical Drift, and Bordered Lives. Her latest book is The Contested Crown, Repatriation Politics Between Mexico and Europe, and that came out earlier this year. You can find more information about Dr. Von Zinnenberg Carroll's work at kdja.org. Hello, everyone. I'm joining you now from Vienna, so very close to Prague. I'm heading up a research project here called Repatriates and New Originals. We are artists, a collective working on the process of repatriation and the creative responses to these affective um, dimensions, especially of reparations. I'm particularly interested in shifting the popular image of the you know, adventurer, mm, the colonial fantasy, I guess, of imperialism that still holds a lot of Europeans in sway. And this is, of course, one of many such um, popular heroes of a kind um, who is a, a tomb raider, a, um, a looter of artifacts. And, um, and it's those kinds of, of cultural artifacts taken during colonialism that is uh, the focus of my work. So just to introduce the, the themes and methods and, and ultimately the kind of ontological shift that I'm looking at in my work. Um, there's a tension obviously at present in the, the so-called kind of discussion of decolonization, that term in itself has been somewhat emptied out of its um, of its meaning. It's a very old process that has been happening through the 20th century. Um, the politics, of course, of that are, are very strongly pitted um, against and with the ethics uh, that are now making repatriations imperative. On the other side of that initial line at the top of this diagram, uh, you see scientific conservation, something that is often used by museums um, to retain objects, uh, to retain control, to retain a kind of um, uh, a set of uh, stipulations, let's say, which can be used in the case that I'll present today as a ruse um, to actually um, to deflect repatriations. So we're dealing with material culture on one hand, but we're also dealing with a whole lot of legal, um, and we will hear more about this from my colleague, uh, legal issues and what happens when objects are given rights of their own, like a human right. Um, then we are actually in the realm of, of mediating between material and, um, and other agents that are not human entirely or 
So we go in methodologies then into oral history, into performance, into the ways in which um, there has been an interface between human and non-human agents, obviously, for a long time. Um, not so much, though, or in a very different way in, in current museology. So that's why we're working with this uh, quite new idea of artistic research, and that is we're all practicing artists, working with materials directly, but also conducting historical research, um, looking at how copies are produced, what is the significance of them, what is the, the ontological shift when you create copies of these kinds of originals that are or are not being repatriated, and what are then the roles, um, especially of, of a shifting um, emphasis on Indigenous knowledge and, um, and an understanding, therefore, of what we term intangible heritage or memory or the affective dimensions of, of loss and oblivion and these kinds of um, dimensions of historical repair that are becoming uh, apparent through the restitution uh, debate. This process um, has become one around the world, and I'm really working comparatively with my team of of researchers that are based in stakeholder communities and working um, very closely. Uh, so for example, in, in Nigeria and Benin Republic, um, very familiar works perhaps there in the center, but also with contemporary artists like the National Museum at the top there where it says total destruction is Eduardo Abaroa's work, a Mexican artist. Um, envisaging another kind of future for the museum in which it is actually dismantled. Um, I will be discussing modes of, of hacking the museum. Um, in my book, I talk about the ways in which people have conceived of, um, of looting, of property ownership, of all the many dimensions uh, of the repatriation debate. And I use as a prismatic example, this one um, headdress, this feather crown that is in Vienna, and that is a long-standing claim from um, Mexico. So to some extent, we're working on the back of Macron's promise to return uh, objects from sub-Saharan Africa in particular back um, from the Musée de Quai to these new museums that are opening around Africa at present. We're going to Namibia this week with a German return uh, from the Humboldt Forum. And I've been working in Vienna for a long time. Um, this is a podium discussion we ran at the Weltmuseum Wien, which is the, the collection of ethnographic material in Vienna, um, of which I also do an ethnography in this book, um, Mit Fremden Federn, Quetzale Panikwatl, and Restitutionsfall. This is a German um, recent publication that actually was launched this evening and why I'm pre recording uh, this lecture. In that book, I also create these um, relationships between historical moments in which the the feather crown um, becomes uh, a way of seeing the very complex power relations between, um, in this case, the Aztec and the Habsburg empires. You see here, uh, for example, in the center, the execution of Maximilian, the emperor of Mexico for three years, a Habsburg emperor sent from Vienna, who's execution is the inception of the independent nation state. This is the work by Nina Höchtel, a Austrian artist living in Mexico City, who conceives in a lucha libre um, character and, and an actual kind of series of fights and cartoons and performances that have been going for the past 10 years of um, this, this battle, which is very, very deeply um, ingrained in the Austrian psyche. There are many operas through the 17th, 18th centuries that replay this conquest of the new world um, in a rather uh, nostalgic and romantic way. So I trace uh, 
in, and these are each of these diagrams is a is an epi um, graph to each chapter. So it maps out what in that chapter, for example, here is a history of the display, um, the museum uh, vitrines, the kinds of ways in which at first in the 16th century it came into a Wunderkammer um, in, in this castle, Ambras, uh, and, and spent decades there uh, as part of this very early uh, display of um, curiosities, was also performed with, um, was part of an early interest in um, naturalia, in, in remedies, in plants from the new world, in, um, yeah, in, this is, it's still extant um, installation. And actually the reason I, I worked on this material uh, was because I could find um, an interesting link between my own family history and, um, and, a, and a, a herbalist, a woman who was not allowed to be a doctor, but was working with, um, with this kind of knowledge that we often associate to, let's say, indigenous people. But of course, in the Alps, we also have um, old ways of, of knowing uh, nature. And there was, um, I argue, an interest at that moment, obviously, in collecting um, things like the Panacho. This is its current display in the Weltmuseum, or rather, um, a photograph by Tal Adler of its um, of its new vitrine that it got, um, which is partly and a very strong argument for its not being mobile, not being able to be repatriated, because it is too fragile. It is said to move. However, this argument of fragility, as as well as it is um, held, uh, you see a diagram of an aeroplane here in the center, which is part of the scientific report that was made by and commissioned from the museum um, and government during a binational uh, research project to prove that it is too fragile to, to be transported and um, it would need a 300 kilometer, no, 300 meter long um, <laughs> kilometer. It's so exaggerated, everything that is in these terms, aeroplane to kind of buffer the, the impact of, of takeoff and landing. But of course, there are all sorts of technologies which uh, counter vibrations. And I've spoken to uh, the scientists also that worked partly also from UNAM in Mexico City on this binational commission and did not agree with this very politicized um, outcome of, um, of a scientific report. And you see here some details of that. And you also see the ways in which um, this uh, culture is still living through the concheros, through the dancers um, in Mexico City who also remake um, very much based on the codices that show us in detail how uh, this feather work was made by the Amanteca, the, the feather workers in the Aztec Empire. Here you see them making exactly these kinds of sacred crowns. This is the backside and it shows also the damage, especially through insects, actually in the museum in Vienna, um, to the fe feathers. Um, and nevertheless, it remains this extremely resplendent, um, but also in these kinds of macroscopic details, one can see the conservation um, errors of the past. Um, this was the early custodian of the crown who also had a strong intervention and through a, a, um, a conservation treatment. Now, this is the museum today. Um, it, it on one hand quite ambivalently celebrates its uh, imperial past with Sissi and you see in her sunglasses is reflected this crown of Panacho and it is, it's deeply ingrained in the merchandise um, of the museum in its imperial shop um, and this is my desk. There are all sorts of um, chocolates and I've been thinking about how indeed artists will use the, the museum space once things have been returned. And this includes um, performative works with a Nigerian um, Swiss group called Yagbon's Mirror and Onirikon in which um, performatively uh, Benin masks are recreated 
are are performed are kind of performatively also um, stolen from the museum. Um, these are the kinds of originals that uh, we refer to, and I will show perhaps just this short snippet from that film, or this performance rather. Um, but the audience doesn't know if it's a performance or what will happen exactly, although this is an actress that you see at the start. Are you aware that a large part of the collection in our museums comes from colonial looting? Yes. And do you think it's normal mm -hmm. that this work is what, in is, what is normal these days? These days? These days it's nothing. Yeah. Sorry. No. So that's just the first few minutes of um, a film that I made um, <clears throat> as part of the team also contributing a sound installation to that um, performance you just saw. Mm. On the topic of sound, um, there was a recent brilliant um, hack of the Velvet Museum, and especially on this topic of the Panacho, where um, a group of activists uh, replaced the audio guides in the museum with their own, well, with the voice of the protester who has been leading the protest movement um, to return this piece for over 30 years. I remember as a child seeing him protesting in Vienna. And, um, and so they, they did this and the museum didn't notice that 50 new versions of their audio guide were circulating. They were quite careful not to steal the audio guides, but to just replace um, the, the headsets with the data and otherwise have the same, um, the same audio guide except for the entry on the Panacho. And then um, they filmed this and, and it went viral on TikTok and, and now um, will become the subject of a feature film. Meet Shokan Ostatol, an activist who has been fighting for 40 years for Austria to give back to Mexico the sacred crown of Aztec Emperor Moctezuma. The sacred crown was looted by Spaniards after Moctezuma's assassination 500 years ago and now resides at the Weltmuseum in Vienna, where visitors only hear the patronizing European version of the story. That it was the feather crown of Moctezuma, this can't be true. Shokan Ostadol is the voice of Aztec descendants who had protested for years at the Welt Museum and were silenced by Austrian authorities. But not anymore. We created 50 exact replicas with all the museum's original tracks, but changed the audio of the Moctezuma's Crown Exhibition, with Shokan Ostadol's voice telling the truth. Significa el regreso de nuestros antepasados. Lo queremos de vuelta. Then we hacked the audio guide system, introduced them in the museum, and documented the reactions. We are in Vienna. Tomorrow we're going into the museum. Let's do it. We will go into the museum, then we walk around normally. There we take our audio guide with our own recordings. In the exit, we leave those two audio guides in the basket. Hackearon el Museo de Viena. Cuéntanos cómo infiltraron las audio guías y qué dice el audio. Penacho de Moctezuma sigue siendo motivo de polémica. Y cambiaron los audios de guía. Sobre esa pieza histórica mexicana. Artistas mexicanos que pudieron cambiar audio guías. Hay que seguir insistiendo que nos devuelvan 
el penacho que pertenece a los mexicanos. Austrian Parliament member Petra Bayer heard the audio guide and decided to submit a motion to return the crown to Mexico. I plan to bring in uh, another motion to Parliament next week. This is the most significant step ever in the historical fight to return Moctezuma's crown. The cry of Moctezuma's descendants has finally been heard. Audio guides of the truth. So in the book I just launched, I was also tracing very much the history of all the artists and activists who have been involved. Um, and these are pictures um, from those protests that I was saying, taken by uh, Liesl Ponger and other um, local artists. And um, there are within the kind of popular imagination already of this piece, as you see here with this marzipan uh, confectionery, um, which I've put next to just one of many images of the very violent um, uh, suppression of the protests where people were really beaten and imprisoned for months and then deported from Austria um, for actually peacefully protesting outside the museum, dancing. Um, and, and this was in the 90s. So a lot of what I've been doing is uh, discourse-based as well as um, these more um, kind of counter-appropriative measures. And that is um, hosting, uh, this is a long table um, in the Maritime Museum in London, where we invited, I had a fellowship um, there to deal with the Captain Cook um, commemoration. And I used that funding to bring Pacific Islanders to the table here with the museum staff and the public and really discuss what it is we should be doing um, with this legacy. And then that turned again into a film um, which, which circulated in different formats around the world. I think I'm going to stop there um, and, and look forward very much uh, to your questions. These are just close-ups of some of those um, tiny diagrams that I was showing you. Um, and I'll finish here on the contemporary artist uh, who lives in New York, um, Claudia Pena Salinas, and um, a piece called Quetzali, where she is also playing with the copy of the original of the Penacho, there's a copy in Mexico City. Um, and, and this is half, half, and she has um, transposed them together um, in the DePaul Art Museum. I'd look really forward to, to discussing this further with you. Thank you. All right, that was Dr. Khadija Zinver von Carroll. Um, she has not yet joined us for the Q&A, but she might still. So if you do have any questions for her, please put it in the Q&A box. Um, I hope she joins us because I would love to learn more about some of those daring and creative interventions in the museum. Um, but now we have ample time for the q and I see folks are using the Q&A box. Um, I'm gonna get us started because I did have a question for Damien. Damien, thank you so much for sharing your experiences uh, working in Australia. And I was struck, but not unsurprised, with how many parallels there are to um, the situation for Indigenous cultural heritage workers, both in the US and Canada. Um, you know, just thinking about the low representation in the cultural heritage field and how the, the mainstream field has really disregarded uh, First Nations work in putting together protocols. I know it took uh, the Society of American Archivists at least 10 years to ratify the protocols in Native American materials. So one thing that I'm curious about, are there cross-continental um, conversations happening between different First Nation Indigenous groups around strategies that have been successful you know, different solidarity acts and movements um, happening? Yeah, um, excellent question. Uh, there are, but, um, and I've been involved in a few of them, um, but they tend to be facilitated by um, large peak bodies or um, conglomerates or um, institutions. So you're always very aware that you're. Um, to bastardize the quote, but you're always very aware that you're in the master's house um, and the funding available for community 
level knowledge, expertise and, and people from the communities that are most impacted by this work or who have done this groundwork, uh, they're almost never um, in these, these spaces. So um, myself and there's a, a small number of us in Australia that are, are really kind of at the um, really getting up in people's faces and, and grills about this kind of work. Um, but we see each other at every single event um, and it's up to us to act as that conduit between these communities and these spaces to, to actively translate in real time what is being said and try and make sure that um, that community perspective is prioritised. But as you can imagine, that probably know yourself, it can be very fraught and very exhausting work. Um, so yeah, you, you see things like IFLA, um, and there are special Indigenous groups, but um, the spots on those are not always reserved for First Nations or Indigenous peoples, um, and what gets lost in translation um, when you haven't lived or worked in these communities can be quite profound. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question that came from the audience. Um, how do you how do you involve Indigenous library workers in the work of decolonization and outreach, but also not overburden them when there are so few? Yeah. Um, I wish my managers and directors had an answer for that question. I've probably burnt out a couple of times in my <laughs> relatively short career. Um, I suppose the first step is recognising that, that library work is, is a much broader term than we're comfortable with in a lot of our institutions. Um, an elder that is holding three generations of, of oral histories and cultural protocols um, is an expert. Um, we wouldn't refer to them as historian and we often wouldn't pay them as such. Um, there's a thing that happens here that the burden of opportunity. Um, every library, every archive, every space that wants to suddenly decolonize and recognizes the importance of it creates an opportunity for, for First Nations voices to come in. But you know that you have to seize that moment then and there while people have the empathy or they've got short-term project funding. And so you end up spreading yourself very, very thin. For me, it's about transparency of expectations and the limitations of what we're about to do. Um, I will never pitch a project as healing or as um, transformative. That may very well be a result that comes out of it, but it's, it's very, very um, problematic to go in to these spaces and claim that you can you can heal a community. Often you, you do a little more damage before you get to that point, and that's part of the process. Payment. Um, <clears throat> there, I will not speak to an elder or have any input from First Nations communities that are being paid. Um, so when I started here in New South Wales, we um, immediately, uh, it's about $130 an hour, regardless of whether that's being fed into an exhibition, whether the work becomes something that's publicly seen, setting that standard and recognizing that expertise, the same way we would with a historian or a preservation expert, um, no longer taking for granted these vast amounts of knowledge that have been given over and over again to these institutions. Um, and I suppose taking the work to community. We spend a lot of time on the road <coughs> in these communities, taking the collections or the nearest copy we can, um, and actually doing that work in people's kitchens while they're making dinner, and um, sitting and having a meal with people instead of forcing people into an uncomfortable context and then expecting them to, to recall knowledge systems that are connected to their families, to their country, to their rivers, to their mountains. Um, it's expensive work, um, and you'll often be told that there aren't the resources. Uh, but we have resources, we just aren't prioritizing them. Facts. <laughs> um, I have one more follow-up question for you. Um, speaking of centering Indigenous voices and expertise, uh, in the U.S. there's a lot of conversation around the tool of Mercudu. Um, the content management system that centers Indigenous knowledge. I'm curious um, if that's something that you've used in your work and what kind of effect you've seen that has. Yeah, um, so I've used, we're currently using Mukatu um, uh, in our work to set up localized digital keeping places. Um, so the library provides the infrastructure, the hosting, but has no access to the archive. We provide training. Uh, those spaces are built for the communities to store their own digital heritage. Um, I've also previously used software called, uh, it's now called Keeping Culture, uh, which is um, pr profound, amazing software, but very expensive um, and really out of the reach of most communities. Um, the systems are very good. They rely on a lot of work that is hidden, taking place before you can get to the point where you can build and make public in any way um, a 
complex system that includes cultural permissions, includes things like the traditional knowledge labels that we see come out of Mukherjee, which are phenomenal. They're amazing, but we don't support the communities to get to that point. And I've seen a lot of communities shortcut important cultural work in order to capitalize on being able to set up a keeping place. And that keeping place, as I mentioned before, with digitization, things that they're farming in from other institutions come loaded with all of that colonial baggage and that work to unpack that. Um, yeah, it's very important to set up spaces. Um, cultural interface theory is a, a big thing over here 20 years ago, which talks about this, this third space between these two cultures which has to be rough and is where that conversation and contested history can happen. But that has to be a flexible space um, and you have to be ready to have that conversation. So we're focusing a lot more on digitizing the equipment, the, the, the training, the support that needs to happen to get to that point and recognizing that setting up a digital archive shouldn't be the end point um, and definitely shouldn't be the start point. It's part of that conversation. Um, but it is wonderful software and it's really good to see that um, more institutions are looking at it. I worry that they, they look at that and are racing towards that and hoping that it will cancel out some of the very difficult work that needs to happen before that. Yeah, thank you for foregrounding how much time it takes to build these systems and, uh, you know, it's not an endpoint, but it's really part of the conversation. I think a lot of institutions try to rush that process in order to say that they are working on a type of project like that and it becomes very performative and really defeats the purpose of working with communities. Um, so I'm going to switch gears and ask a question of Layla. Um, this seems to have come up in other panel discussion. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on what is the definition of what constitutes sale under duress? The Nazi World War II context seems pretty clear, but what about other conflict or refugee situations? Uh, interestingly, I don't think it is clear with Nazi looted art either. Um, there have been a number of cases within the past couple of years that have brought up this the issue of whether or not a sale was under duress, but all these cases have been dismissed under other grounds. So I mentioned the case of um, Philip versus Germany, and that was dismissed due, due to like jurisdictional issues. And the court never made a determination about whether the sale was under duress. They never determined, um, you know, that there was kind of this checklist that, um, you know, just because a work sold for under its market value does not necessarily mean it's duress. And I think there have been people in the legal field that want to see a clear answer from the court. Similarly, there was another case dismissed within a, the past few years that also involved duress. It was a work that was in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And again, that case was dismissed early on. So the court never addressed what it means for a sale to be under duress. I think there are some you know, some very clear cases that have been decided, but there's not really a specific guideline. Um, and I know there haven't really been cases, and I, I, I think it's a really good question because there haven't really been cases outside the context of Nazi looted art where ownership has been questioned due to this like forced sale or duress sale. Um, it would be nice to see a case like that come forward. Um, but again, like with the law, there are a few hurdles you need to get over first. And part of the problem with some of these cases is that these takings, these thefts occurred long ago. So when we're talking about thefts from the past, many of them were decades ago. So you would need to get over the hurdle of a statute of limitations or even that question, it's something I vaguely alluded to or like briefly alluded to, um, who has standing? So if it's something that was taken from a community, who has standing within that community? Um, so I think that's another challenge facing indigenous communities and other communities outside of you know, a sovereign nation. We see nations that are defined by certain borders and are recognized as a sovereign state bringing cases or you know, filing cases, but I think it's, it's a little more challenging for non-nation state communities or groups. So thinking about gray area and also uh, reflecting on what you said about how there really is no legal framework for this type of work in Australia, um, what are some alternative forms of approaching or resolving cultural heritage disputes that you've seen have been successful apart from these legal-based approaches? Yeah, so I think the past couple of years are 
they give me some reason for optimism because I think different stakeholders are engaging in discussions and just calling out the behavior of museums in the past. And I think it's encouraging and there's much more that needs to be done, but I think it's encouraging that there are museums in the U.S. I think it was the MFA in Boston that has agreed to return some of the Benin bronzes. Same thing in the U.K. There have been a couple of British institutions. I know Germany has committed to returning objects. So I think there is a movement and I don't know if it's possible to, you know, to right all these wrongs and to return all these objects, but I think it's really positive that there is some movement on that front. And I think there's a role for the press to play, for the public to play, for donors. Um, I mean, kind of a little bit unrelated, but still, you know, kind of tangential to this discussion, we see institutions removing names of controversial donors, like the name of the Sackler family. They received such bad media attention for, you know, their role in the opioid crisis. And it's incredible that now museums around the world, French museums, um, I think the Louvre, the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, um, I believe one of the Smithsonian museums have removed the Sackler name from its wall, from their walls. I think that's really a positive sign. And I hope that kind of public pressure encourages institutions to do the same thing and to make amends to other communities and, you know, move outside of just the law and look at ethics as well. Thank you. Um, we do have a follow-up question for you about the bust case that you mentioned earlier. Has there been research uh, into where the bust was before it came to Germany and how it came to be there? Has that been a part of the story? Uh, a lot of people are questioning that, whether you've seen this comment a lot about why the bust wasn't returned to Italy because it was Roman, but we don't know where it came. And, you know, the Roman Empire doesn't mean Italy. You know, we're not, by saying it's Roman doesn't necessarily mean it came from the modern nation of Italy. And it was removed wherever, wherever it was removed from, it was acquired by a German, a Bavarian king prior to the establishment of the Republic of Italy. So I don't think the Republic of Italy has any claims. In fact, I represent the government of Italy in an antiquities case, and I can't imagine Italy is going to make a claim for the work. Um, so it was acquired by a, a Bavarian king, and he had it as early as 1833, which predates Italy's patrimony laws. So it's not going back to Italy. It's going back to Germany. I think all the stakeholders are, are happy with that solution. Thank you. Um, I had a follow-up question. So you talked um, a lot about cases that deal with antiquities. I'm wondering if you can speak to any cases that deal with more contemporary cultural heritage, I mean, 17, 18, 19, 20th century, and if there are any difference in dealing with repatriation for antiquities versus um, more contemporary materials. So when I, I talk about patrimony laws, we have to look at what the definition is in each nation. So every nation has a different type of patrimony law, or, you know, they they protect different types of materials and different um, materials of different ages. So contemporary materials generally aren't covered on, under those laws because at a minimum when cultural heritage is defined, it's defined as being over a certain age. So I don't really see contemporary materials being covered as frequently, although there are laws in Europe. So think about Pablo Picasso, some of his works are over a hundred years. And some of these patrimony laws in Europe will cover works by Picasso or works by other 20th century artists. And these are becoming controversial. Um, and that's a, that's a whole other kind of question as to who gets to define that as their heritage. So a country like France where, you know, Picasso is Spanish, a country like France has denied the right of owners to sell their works outside of France, to export their works out of France. So there's some controversy there as well as how do we define heritage? Who gets to define it? And I think that's actually a really important issue to look at as to who's defining heritage. Should it be just based upon age? Um, does it have something to do with like the nationality of the artist? And should that be a consideration? Um, it seems funny for me to be asking that as someone in the U.S. where, you know, it's, we're such a melting pot. Um, so I think these are really difficult questions of how do we define heritage and how do we value heritage? I think it goes back to that question of what do we value enough to protect? Thank you so okay. much. Um, I see that Khadija just joined us. Um, hi, Khadija, welcome. 
I hope your other event went well. Yes, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm actually still out, but I wanted to log in as I'm on my way home and say yes, I'm here for questions, to listen mostly probably for the next 10 minutes, but yeah. Excellent. Um, well, I would love to ask you a question because I really enjoyed your presentation and hearing about the different interventions. Um, I'm curious if you could say more about how the public responded when they engaged with the audio guides um, that were replaced um, and if and how you think that changed the public dialogue around this issue of repatriation. I mean, I know the parliament member has um, made the move, made the motion to return it, but I'm curious what you see in um, public discourse. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so I've just been part of a big public discourse. That's why I haven't been with you live. And I noticed that there is a an increased interest here in what artistic voices, what questions they might ask and how they might ask those differently, how um, there's a, a kind of a simplicity but still a, a great um, kind of future-oriented vision that came with that intervention. And um, there were quite a few people just now in the audience here live uh, who were from the government and who are kind of asking, yeah, very pragmatic questions now. So I think it's really shifted the discourse from wondering, like, what might the ethics of it be to just how actually practically and the only thing that stands in that, um, in the way of that is really this kind of scientific, technical question of how to transport in that case the object. So um, that's been an interesting shift that actually the ethics have, have been resolved, it feels like. Maybe not through that intervention alone, but through the discourses that we've been discussing over the past few days. Thank you for sharing. Um, your audio is cutting out a little bit, so... Um, yeah. Okay. And to the yeah. audience, please take advantage of the fact that Khadija has joined us and put your uh, questions in the Q&A box. Um, in the meantime, we do have another question for Damien. Um, how can you address issues with Indigenous items held in private museums? Uh, private museums. Um, I mean, without <coughs> condoning outright violence and theft, uh, it's a tricky one. Um, it's very hard to know what's in private collections um, and some of the issues that uh, our other speakers have mentioned and the stipulations on how those can be viewed or borrowed, but these are not accessible to the general public, let alone um, First Nations communities that, that um, live hundreds of kilometres away and, and don't know that it's there. Um, interestingly, one of the tactics I use is, um, is kind of infiltrating. So, um, staff that I've worked with, First Nations staff um, that I've worked with and trained up to become curators. Um, a few of those have actually gone to work in these museum spaces and are taking with them, uh, you can probably tell, I tend to radicalise people a little. Uh, they're taking that with them and there is now somebody within that institution um, to, to address some of those problems. Um, awareness raising, I mean, you don't get very far if you trigger um, white fragility or a sense of shame around that, even if that you know, private museum knows that what they have is stolen and knows that the families that donated it um, did so illegally, um, it is not a productive way to do it. Um, but we have found some success also in leveraging our strengths as a you know, premier collecting institution. Um, we can borrow things and all of these systems are set up for long-term loans to be for exhibition, but I've had some success in securing long-term loans not for exhibition. So these can be sat in a room with the descendants that I can find funding to bring people in to sit with these objects, to have some semblance of that control, to, to return stories, to sing to these items, to sit with something that was with their old people, um, which is nowhere near repatriation, but is a step on that, uh, in that journey. And when those donors and the private curators and museums and collectors see that and sort of sense the importance of these items and these collections to real living people, um, it can really trigger that conversation um, towards moving into a, into a return of a repatriation.
I think that's um, a great point to transition into this question that's very broad, um, and I think everyone might be able to respond to this. What do museums of the future look like? Tough question, I would think, that I think we're moving into new institutions that are more inclusive, that are curated, hopefully more responsibly. I think that museum boards are becoming, at least in the US, um, I think they're becoming a little more diverse or intending to. Um, and I think with more diverse boards, with more representative boards and employees, it's possible to curate in a more uh, accurate, more respectful way. And I think that will also be reflected in what museums um, acquire as well, perhaps be more diligent and perhaps try to include a more you know, representative collection, whether, you know, not just race or ethnicity, but genders, you know, sexual preference. You know, I think museums are trying to do that and I hope they have success. And I think, I think we should reflect on where, you know, where they were 30 or 40 years ago. And I think there has been progress, but there's still a lot to be done. So hopefully within the next couple of decades, we can see more representative collections and kind of make up Damien or Khadija, would you like to respond to the question of what do museums of the future look like? Sure. Um, I mean, as you can probably tell, I can talk forever. Um, I'm definitely more of a library nerd, but I think the same principles apply. Uh, these spaces need to be open and critical, um, and we need to be encouraging the kinds of conversations that we've, we've seen um, today and that we know are happening on the fringes. Um, I want to see these museums taking those risks um, so that the, the safety of these projects and this radical work isn't always a risk taken by um, communities, whether those are First Nations, queer, um, even women in a lot of these spaces are taking that risk on. The institution can wear that risk um, as the institution is much more, um, much more resilient and they're not going anywhere um, for, for better or for worse. Um, I think we need to just stop thinking about our spaces as static structures and think about them as places where conversations can happen. There's a lot of really exciting stuff with creative fellowships, creative engagement with historical collections can cover off and uh, interrogate trauma without having to be trauma porn, without having to just trot out another dozen pictures of, of mission broken First Nations people and instead can be vibrant, colourful reflections. And I think we're seeing a shift towards that, which I'm very excited about. Thanks. Khadija, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, the future of museums. I mean, one can offer, there's a spectrum of responses and, and there's also a radical kind of dissolution of the museum that might need to happen because, to be honest, like there's a pathology within them about keeping and the people who are kind of keeping and and become uh almost like um i mean they're guardians of this material but but in european museums where i work there's a there's a lack of access and and kind of sense of um public due diligence which i think actually needs some quite radical change and um there are some cultures, obviously, that feel like their ancestors are, are good as, as ambassadors and as kind of uh, ways of keeping a relationship with the future museum. But I think these institutions are so deeply imperial and so um, there's so much structural racism within them that, uh, you know, the kinds of change that it's true has happened over the last 30 years. Um, I'm not sure that we can get to a place with the current kind of imperial museum structure that we we want to get to in the future i think that there's going to need to be um yeah a way in which also objects move like quite far outside and that's what curatorially is happening a lot we're using public space we're kind of traveling exhibitions outside of these um museum institutions so I don't know, just to offer another perspective from someone who doesn't work within them, but rather against them. I think, um, yeah, I think they're not really, uh, 
serving the people that that other stakeholders really. Well, I think this is a great great point to conclude the conversation. Thank you all so much for participating in this panel and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, Jade, is there are there any last words you'd like to share? Yeah, so I just wanna thank all the panelists and TK for moderating. It's been such a great program. And thank you all for attending this program and if you've attended other programs too, and this is the last of our program. And so please do fill out the survey because we do want to know um, we're open to ideas as to how we should proceed in continuing this conversation. And so um, do do that. And if you haven't checked out our digital exhibit, there's a link to it um, from our guide. And um, again, thank you for coming. Have a great rest of your day and evening, wherever you are, and keep in touch. Bye.